Hello from London. I'm Prashant Rao, Senior Editor at The Atlantic, where I oversee our global affairs reporting. Thank you for joining us for the fourth and final day of our annual Atlantic Festival. We're here for the big story to talk about American foreign affairs. For nearly four years, the United States has been governed by a nationalist president, Donald Trump, who has taken foreign policy in, to put it mildly, a different direction from his predecessors. How has he changed the world's view of America? What lessons can we take from history, from abroad, from literature, about his presidency and where America is going? What should leaders across the world expect from a potential Trump second term? And if he doesn't get reelected, has America's standing in the international ch order changed for good anyway? Joining us from Poland uh, is Atlantic staff writer Anne Applebaum. And from here in the UK, Atlantic staff writer Tom McTague. Uh, welcome both. Um, so we know uh, those of you listening at home will have questions, uh, and I would love if you could ask them in the chat function. We have 45 minutes today, and we'll do the best we can to answer as many of them as possible. But let's get started with how Trump has changed America's place in the world. Uh, Tom, can you get us started? Tell us about the pandemic and how it's changed how foreigners like you and me see America. And also a little bit as well, you've written about this, about how so much of the concern is rooted in how he has changed the norms of American democracy, if not the actual laws. Yeah, I think I think that's right. There's a kind of uh, there's the tangible and the intangible. There is the w w sitting here and you um, before the pandemic, you know, America was known for, you know, all the things that we that we think about. You know, there was an unfairness in its healthcare system, but it was also cutting edge. It was the best in the world. Uh, at, you know, at the, at, the, at the really hard stuff because it had the money, it had the expertise, it had the universities, it had the technical base. Um, it had, you know, it had the economy um, that was there to support um, America in, in, in an emergency. Uh, so it was rated the number one, um, you know, most prepared for a pandemic with Britain actually sitting in number two. Now, what the pandemics revealed is, well, that wasn't true, you know, and that's that's a fundamental problem. So, you know, I don't think we yet know exactly why Britain and America have fa uh, fared so badly. It's something beyond just uh, the leaders, uh, but it reveals something at its core. And I think that is hard to unsee. Once you've seen that, it's very hard to unsee. So it's it's these intangible things. It's the America not being in certain places, um, say the Greek-Turkish uh, situation at the moment. I was speaking to somebody here uh, in Europe who was saying previously the tensions there wouldn't have been allowed to get to this stage because America would have been there. Uh, I've been struck by the lack of American interest until very recently in the Irish situation between um, the UK and the EU. So there are all of these intangibles that I think are, are being picked up in Europe, a sense that America is no longer quite as interested in the world and it's more interested in itself. And Anne, can you tell us a little bit as well, you know, you've written about this, about the weakness, how Trump has kind of illustrated some of the weakness of America's institutions, you know, whether it's the Republican Party, you know, that was a focus of your cover story earlier this year, or other American institutions and democratic norms. So, I mean, one of the oddities of American foreign policy right now is that it really exists along two separate tracks. Um, in some ways, American foreign policy continues to be exactly what it was and what it always was. Um, many of the same people doing some of the same things. Um, you know, we're still we still have soldiers in in Europe. So, you know, we haven't we haven't abrogated the NATO treaty, um, and many of the kind of old ways in which America operated kind of continue to work like clockwork um, the way that they always did. Um, what Trump has done is he's added another layer on top of that, and that's really the layer of his personal friends and interests and his interest, for example, in using his relationship with the president of Ukraine in order to get Ukraine to launch a, um, an illegal and unfounded investigation of his political opponent or his, you know, via his son-in-law, his, his personal relationship with the leader of, of Saudi Arabia, um, with whom he, he may also have some business interests and hotels and so on, um, in order to create a relationship there. Um, and he, and by, by, by adding this kind of world of nepotism, kleptocratic contacts, um, 
personal interests, family interests, sort of plonking it on top of the old U.S. foreign policy system, which was, um, you know, put there to promote the interests of America and promote America's alliances and so on. Um, he's really shaken and, and, and confused um, uh, uh, American allies because many of the values that Trump himself espouses or just simply illustrates in his personality and his way of doing are actually in direct contradiction to the values that the United States has promoted for the last six years. I mean, rule of law by itself is one of them. Um, you know, the absolute respect for the idea that, um, that, that, that justice is something that's independent from politics, at least as far as it can be, that there is such a thing as independent courts, um, that, you know, that, for example, the U.S. president would never intervene in another country's judicial system in order to investigate, falsely investigate his, um, his, his opponent, but also in the way that Trump behaves at home, um, the, the sort of grotesque speed with which he and the Republican Party um, are seeking to replace the missing seat on the Supreme Court, even though they said exactly the opposite about... Um, uh, you know, about about replacing Supreme Courts in an election year four years ago, um, that shows that these are, you know, these are people who have abandoned an essential principle, which is that you deal with a situation in the same way, regardless of whose party interests are at stake. Um, and losing that means that much of what the U.S. stood for, you know, it stood for an idea about democracy, it stood for an idea of, um, uh, you know, of, of um, you know, shared values. A lot of that has been really profoundly undermined. Um, both by Trump's personal behavior and by the way it's impacted American foreign policy. And, and just staying with you, you know, you've written a lot about, um, you obviously know very well Poland and its immediate neighborhood, uh, and you've written about what we can possibly learn from Poland, Hungary, elsewhere. I mean, what, what has, you know, conversely, what has Trump done to empower sort of um, nationalist and populist leaders in that, in that neck of the woods? Is that something that he's been exporting? I mean, how, how do you see it play out? It's a tremendous amount. It's something I've been thinking about a lot, actually, in the run-up to the election, because I've been trying to think what a second term of Trump would mean, um, not just for this part of the world, but for elsewhere. Um, and there is no question that the tactics and techniques that he uses um, inside the United States are copied and imitated and echoed around the world. I mean, just if you take alone his denigration of the media, you know, his use of this, his twisting around of this expression, fake news, um, and the direct and open attacks on journalists, on proprietors, on, you know, on people who own news institutions as well as the people who work for them, um, his, 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 um, his, his disregard for them, his turning of the tradition of the press conference into a kind of weird pantomime joke, um, joke event. Um, these are all, first of all, these are all tricks that have been used in the past by authoritarian leaders. I mean, the the corrupt press conference is a, was a was a famous um, uh, a famous element of communist Poland. It's a famous element of Putin's Russia. Um, but they've also, they, but having once borrowed them from them, they are now copied and imitated all over the world. So, you know, any anybody who doesn't want to be held account, anybody who is corrupt. Anybody who um, who is seeking to avoid scrutiny for whatever reason um, now knows that they can copy and use the same techniques as 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 Trump does. And so, for example, I mean, during the period of the Trump presidency, um, the Hungarian government has taken over something like 90 to 95 percent now of Hungarian media, which is now owned either by the state directly or by the connected to the state. Um, and you can see similar, you know, preparations for similar kinds of attacks and, so, you know, happening in other places as people simply copy what he does. Um, and a second Trump term, I think, would lead to more of this and the further empowerment of um, both a liberal or an authoritarian or would-be authoritarian leaders in, in, in many different places. And Tom, getting away, you know, getting closer to where you and I live, uh, what's the perception in London and, you know, also to the sort of European capital you talk to about um, how American foreign policy has changed uh, and how, you know, America sees Europe differently? Yeah, I think it comes back to something that Anne was talking about there, the sort of the American idea and how Trump challenges that. And, you know, when you go back and you look at uh, what Trump has been saying since the 80s, you know, when he burst onto the scene with his letter to the American people, um, he he has openly challenged 
the American idea and the the idea of you know what America stands for and essentially the international order. There has never been, um, it's never really been hidden. It's always been there, and I think you see these twin kind of. Um, impulses with Trump, this impulse to restore American greatness back to the kind of world that he uh, existed in, lived in in the 50s and 60s, this uh, America supreme, supreme everywhere. But also the, the other instinct to pull away from that and to reject the ties that come with that, the, the responsibility of global leadership, which is uh, you know, a big responsibility and it comes with costs. So you see from from here in Europe, a legitimate demand to say Europe needs to pay more for its defence. It needs to contribute more. Germany needs to lead more. Um, why should we do this? Um, and he, he asks that question all over the world. But this is then the tension. If you withdraw, if your instinct is to withdraw, it comes with the uh, giving up some leadership and giving up some control. And he doesn't appear to be willing to do that. So he has this desire ultimately to dominate and to not not give way, to get his way entirely. And Britain is one of the countries that is having to deal with that. Take 5G, for example, Huawei. Um, essentially, Trump has used American power and used it effectively to bully Britain into changing its position. From an American perspective, that has been quite successful. But again, it has these long term impacts. How does that make Britain feel? What what relationship then does Britain have with the United States? Does it want to be that dependent on somebody who ultimately wields the stick? That's that's really important and interesting. I, I think what I, before we get into you know the scenarios in November and uh, how a Trump victory would play out, you know, and you sort of spoke about this earlier, I want to think back a little bit to the sort of just recent past of the pandemic, and think through you know what exactly has the pandemic done to America's standing abroad. Uh, from where I sit, it feels as though there is progressively less and less attention in D.C. for key foreign policy questions, um, and at the same time, America's own domestic poor response to the coronavirus has fed into a question about its own capability, its own prestige. Um, is that what both of you see? I mean, Anne, why don't you start? So I, um, I agree. I actually think the pandemic has had a profound effect on the perceptions of America. I mean, profound. And I don't think Americans really understand it yet. And sometimes I hear conversations going on in Washington about what we should or shouldn't do or about what our policy should be. And I just think, don't you know that none of that is possible anymore? Um, a lot of American power, and this is, by the way, just to allude to something Tom just said, a lot of American power in the past, including in whatever period it is that Trump remembers as great, um, was the power of example. It was the power of allies. Um, it was the power of, um, of values. Um, America had something that seemed attractive to other people, and we were able to attract other powerful states into our orbit. Um, because of that, um, you know, in addition to that, there were these concrete, there were trade agreements and there were military alliances and so on. But fundamentally, um, we were powerful because people wanted to be like us and they admired us, or even if they didn't admire us, they still wanted to be like us. Um, and that, I think the pandemic has, you know, is, is one, in a, I would say it's a series of blows to that prestige, um, starting with maybe even Hurricane Katrina going to the Iraq war. Um, and now I think it's a it's a it's a it's been a profound, you know, people are shocked by the, the number of deaths in the United States, but also by the incompetence of Trump, the you know, the, the, the speech about um, bleach. Uh, the, the, you know, the changing from one, you know, one view to the other. Today we wear masks. The next day masks are a, are a, you know, a threat to our personal freedom. Um, and all of that has made people think Americans are irresponsible. They are childish. They are, um, you know, their science isn't as good as we thought it was. Um, you know, but but also it, it, you know, the system itself is perceived to have failed. It's not just that our, you know, pandemic preparedness wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Actually, it turns out that Americans have no faith in their public health system. That our we have deep gaps between, um, you know, the most people and their and and the bureaucracy. Um, people weren't willing to take orders. They didn't believe what the government was telling them. 
I mean, these are these are the kinds of you know, these problems. You know, lack of trust. You know, low um, low social trust. These are the problems of much less developed countries, and it's why America looks at the moment you know a lot more like Brazil um, than it does like Germany. And people see that, and they will say, right, well, is this a country with whom I feel you know in close contact with? Is this a country that shares my values? Um, is it one whose orbit I want to be in? I think people are going to be wondering, are going to feel that less and less. And Tom, do you want to follow up on that? I mean, what? Uh, how, how do you see this playing out? You, you've also, like Anne, written about this. I mean, where do you see this taking America in terms of how the pandemic has impacted both its own perception of itself and also uh, Brits, for example, and others' perceptions of America? Yeah, I, I think Anne is um, is really onto something with that. Just that sense of, hang on, everybody can see that America is not dealing with this. Um, you know, better than Germany or better than most countries. And it's not just failing a little bit compared to these countries. It's failing enormously. As Anne says, it looks more like uh, Brazil than Germany, but it's not just Germany, is it? It's, um, you know, it's the Scandinavian countries. It's Japan. It's South Korea. There's been a sea change in which countries here are well governed. Which countries do you aspire to look like? And at the moment, nobody is really aspiring to look like the United States. And I think that that sort of that that goes really deep into um, into a culture, into sort of who do you look towards? Hey, come to back to the um, uh, to London and to Westminster, um, you know, which I've covered for ten years. Uh, you would you would have seen a caucus in the Conservative Party in particular, but also in the Labour Party that would openly. Uh, aspire to be um, American, to be uh, to copy the the best things from America: American wealth, American American success, American universities, American dynamism. All of these things. Now, now I don't believe that they've all gone. They clearly, they clearly haven't. But you don't get that sense at the moment. It's it's, it's a tiny minority uh, at the moment who talk openly about America, wanting to be like that. You know, you get very few of them. Um, Everything is looking towards Germany. That is the big that, that, that's the country that causes Britain this existential crisis of confidence at the moment in the same way. I wonder whether it's happening in the United States. And then there's just this sense, you know, ultimately, American supremacy uh, post uh, Cold War. You know, America was running this um, this liberal empire. And to some extent, is it too involved now with its own problems to be able to run that and and are the Europeans willing to get on the plane, go to Washington and hand their petitions into the White House for, you know, defence questions or what's happening, in, what's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening in Syria, what's happening with the Iranian nuclear deal? Increasingly, you're seeing these tensions where you're seeing an E3, the European three in, in, in Europe, Germany, Britain and France working together um, in defiance of, of the United States. You're seeing Macron uh, doing interviews uh, in The Economist and the FT and others saying, hey, we need to learn the lessons of this. We need to protect ourselves. These are these are big changes. Now they might not lead anywhere, but um, you know, mentally, there's been a shift. Um, we're just about to get to you know the two principal scenarios for November, but I'd really encourage all of our listeners to put in questions if you want. Uh, if there's anything <laughs> you want any of uh, Anne or Tom to address, um, let's let's go into November um, now. You know, and you sort of flicked at this earlier. What are the scenarios you play out in your head if Trump wins re-election? Uh, well, if I were you, I would start a little bit before that, because the really interesting and – or interesting is the really the wrong word here – the really frightening and possibly impactful outcome is that Trump either wins by not very much or loses by not very much. Or in any case, there's a very long interregnum in which we don't know who is president of the United States and which the United States descends, if not into chaos, because I don't believe that will happen, but at least into an interminable and unfixable dispute. 
um, about who the president is and in which lawyers are used and possibly constitutional tactics that we haven't thought of in 100 years. Um, there's a very brilliant, as you know, both of you know, there's a very brilliant Atlantic cover story that's just been published early, um, which goes through some of these things and points out that there's some real holes in the Constitution. You know, there are some bits of it that haven't been tried in so long, if ever, that we don't know exactly how they would work if they were tested, if, if the president decides, for example, to stay on even though he's lost. Um, he might try and seek a way to do that. In fact, he's been telling us that, that he will um, seek a way to do this. Yeah. And that scenario will have, once again, a really profound and damaging impact on American status around the world and also on the status of democracy and democracies more generally. So, you know, and, and in fact, even if Joe Biden eventually becomes president, um, um, but if we have gone through a period like that, you will have a, um, you know, a much weakened American impact around the world, um, you know, whether we like it or not. And even a second Trump presidency, which has, again, which is somehow questioned or challenged or undermined, um, also has the potential to be incredibly destabilizing simply because of the way it was chosen. But, you know, I, I'd love to hear what Tom thinks um, before we go on to, the, to, to, to either a Biden or a Trump presidency and what either one of those might mean. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I was... Um... I was scrolling through Twitter, as you do earlier, and a friend of mine was just saying, um, a, a journalist, what, what happens in that scenario? What happens if, um, if Trump doesn't concede? What happens if one of the consequences of uh, the pandemic or, or this wave of populism or whatever, whatever it is, is the, the end of American democracy? And I, I thought, well, no, that's not. You know that's over the top. That's not that's not possible. Um, but then you read the cover story or you watch the Trump press conference, and there's a question mark. And I think the the very fact that there is a question mark is actually a story in itself. You know that's that's a, a that's a problem. You know we didn't we've never asked that question before, um, and we we're not asking it about Germany. We're not asking it about Japan. Um, so it's another thing that that starts to eat away at it. Now, you know, there are clearly other scenarios where, you know, Trump goes off uh, if he loses and sets up his TV network and makes a makes a fortune and does his deals in, um, you know, in Moscow or uh, or Turkey or wherever it is that he wants to, to make money. And that's that's certainly a, a scenario. And, and Biden comes in and, and the transfer of power happens. Um, but the question mark is a problem. Um, and yeah, so then let's get back to. I mean, the interregnum is obviously a, a nightmare scenario, as you uh, as you rightly note, Anne. Um, and then, so let's play out these two different worlds: one where Trump wins convincingly enough, and the polls don't seem to indicate this, but you know, it's a long time still to go. Uh, he wins convincingly enough that uh, his his victory is not in question. Um, I mean, what are the what are the kind of foreign policy questions that you are asking yourself? I mean, you you sort of got at the question of like, you know. Is America and NATO in four years? Uh, could ties possibly worsen with China? Um, what, what else is on the table? So certainly NATO is on the table, um, whether not just a question of, you know, will the U.S. leave troops in Europe, although I think that's an important question, but also um, the deeper question, if the Russians, for example, decided to test NATO, um, would we have in Washington the, um, the, the will and even the competence to respond? I mean, that, that would then become a question. Uh, so, you know, that, that's one way. Um, the, you know, the possibility of a, of a, of a, of a military or much, you know, I, I want to be careful how I say this, but some kind of military conflict with China um, also can't be excluded. Um, if at that point the Chinese decided that the United States was weak enough and in badly run enough um, that this would give them their moment, for example, to reassert control over Taiwan. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just making up the scenario. I'm not saying that it would happen, but you know, the, the we would be we would have a Washington that was. Um, you know, weak, unpredictable, badly run, incompetent. Um, I mean, think about who would be 
uh, you know, what kinds of people would be working in a second Trump administration? I mean, we wouldn't have James Mattis. We wouldn't have experienced people. We would have, um, you know, we would have people who are attracted to the chaos of the Trump administration and looking to make careers in it. Um, and, and I think a lot of American adversaries would see that moment and would very much want to take advantage of it. Um, at the same time, as I said, you know, our role as leader of the democratic world would be questioned. Um, democracy itself would come under greater challenge, um, I think, in Europe, um, in, 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 in other parts of the world as well. Um, and the very idea that there is such a thing as a democratic camp that's capable of working together um, might, might, might begin to, to fracture. I mean, one of the odd things that I also think would happen, and you can decide whether you think this is good or bad, you could very well, um, by contrast, have a kind of EU consolidation as Europeans say to themselves, finally, well, that's it. We can't rely on the Americans anymore. And you could have the EU finally unifying itself in terms of foreign policy and security around an anti-American theme. You know, we are the non-America, we're the non-Americans, and we're going to define ourselves that way. Um, and that's not impossible. Um, and, and so the idea that there were then, um, you know, that we, there was no longer a West of any kind, and instead there were Europe and America who were at odds with one another in whether constant trade wars or cultural conflicts or whatever, um, that's, that's, an, that's another real possibility. And Tom, you know, that's actually just following on from what Anne just said. This is something, you know, you've talked about a little bit, right, is this idea of a break between Britain and America or Europe and America and no longer having a unitary West. I mean, what, along with that or any other issues, are you thinking about as a potential consequence of a, of a Trump second term? Yeah, it was, uh, as Anne was talking there, it was making me think about, you know, the breakup of uh, the Roman Empire, you know, it splits into the East and the West, uh, and it maintains a kind of semblance of friendship. Uh, but ultimately, it's pulling in two different directions. It just got too, too big to govern uh, from one from one seat, uh, and too riven internally. Uh, and you, you can kind of see that uh, with the West, uh, and, and particularly if there's a Trump, Trump victory. Now, there might be some, you know, good sides to that, you know, that Europe does uh, take back its uh, its place, uh, its its ability to defend itself. Maybe there is a rebalancing of the world there. Uh, Trump has sort of revealed something underneath that needed to be uh, needed to be revealed. So there are potentially there are potential upsides. Uh, you know, similarly in the Middle East, perhaps um, as we're seeing now, there are there you know there have been some some deals. Um, but I I think ultimately you you will see that the um, these instincts that I talked about with Trump, the ones that pull in two different directions, that that um, you know that are that are there and and can't be tamed. You know, you've seen Mattis and Tillerson and McMaster and Shablow and all of these uh, capable, smart people who have been working in the institution. John Bolton, um, they. They lost, right? You know, Trump, Trump won. Trump over. Uh, Trump, you know, took their national security strategies and took the, you know, took their speeches, and essentially, he didn't stop being himself. He carried on tweeting what he really thinks, which is that Russia should be back into the G7, or that why do we care about what's happening um, in Estonia, or you know, what's in it for us to be fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan? So I suspect what you'll see is. Uh, a continuation unshackled of the instinct to dominate, the instinct to get everything you want in a negotiation, which has seen every multilateral deal um, collapse, where, whether it's Paris, whether it's the nuclear arms uh, treaties, uh, whether it's the Iranian nuclear deal, you know, all of these have collapsed because they're, they're, Trump is not seeking a negotiation in a way. He's seeking to dominate and get his way. There is a question of whether America is powerful enough at the moment to, to do that. And the second instinct is to withdraw. And it runs counter to that first instinct, but it is it is very it's core to, to understanding Trump. You know, he sees the world um, dollars and cents. You know, what is in it? for me to be in the Middle East. You know, as, as I spoke to somebody who was close to Trump who said he doesn't care about Iranian regional influence in, in the Middle East. He doesn't, he doesn't care at all. 
he he wants to do the deal. He wants to do the deal or rip the deal up. Um, but he doesn't he doesn't care about uh, any of these things. He doesn't care about great strategic um, power rivalry uh, with China. He wants to do a deal that can get him. Uh, he wanted to do a deal that could get him elected. Um, so I think you will see that instinct come out as well. You'll see him you know, probably start to pull back uh, and, and, and start removing those chess pieces that Anne talked about that haven't really moved. Um, you know, troops in Eastern Europe, tro troops in uh, Afghanistan. He's wanted to pull out. He's wanted to change these things. Truly, in a second term, there would be much, much more pressure to do that. Um so the next question is actually uh, also comes from uh, a listener, uh, Sandra Hallstrom, and it speaks to something we wanted to discuss anyway, which is let's talk about a potential landslide Biden victory in which it's also, you know, uh, to avoid the notion of interregnum, that he is um, a clear enough victor that he takes office uh, and comes in. Can what has been done by Trump be undone? And if so, how would, uh, how would we go about doing that? A and why don't you lead off? All right. So you're a little garbled, but I think the question is about Biden. Biden uh, has been in a, in a clear in a clear way, and you know, particularly if he wins in the Senate. Um, I mean, look, Biden, if he becomes president, he will immediately be confronted with the worst economic and medical crisis in modern American history. And that will take up all of his time. Um, he will also be confronted with a profoundly divided and angry nation um, in which there will be some people, whatever happens, there will be some people so disappointed with his victory that they are you know, you know, willing to to fight in the streets with other people. I mean, we we know that's going to happen, and so there it will be a moment of enormous domestic crisis, and not one where you can expect the United States to be sort of outwardly looking. Um, but there's also there's a deeper problem. I mean, one of the things I'm most worried about with Biden is that he is surrounded by a lot of people, some of whom will be tempted to want to kind of pretend it all never happened. You know, let's just go back to where we were four years ago. We'll just fight some mantras about the West and NATO and how we're all getting along, really, and it's going to be all fine. I and if he does that, that has a, a, you know also a potential for maybe not for disaster, but for not working. Um, people, even even if Biden wins and even if he wins in a landslide, there is still a lot of distrust for the United States out there. There's an awareness now that part of the American public is willing to vote for a nationalist, an isolationist, and therefore could do so again, you know, in four years when, I don't know, when candidate Jared Kushner is running for office or, or, or whoever it's going to be. Um, and there will be some reluctance to simply say, oh, that's all right then, let's just go back to how it was before. I, I, I mean, what I would, what I hope some of the people around Biden will do is have some creativity and have some consciousness that now is the moment to reinvent some of these institutions to think about them and talk about them in a different way. Because I don't think, um, I don't think the rest of the world is going to just flip the clock back in any kind of easy way. I mean, we're, we can't really pretend that Trumpism never happened. And yeah, Tom, over to you, same question. I mean, let's say a Biden victory, uh, can, can what's been done be undone? And if it can be, what, what needs to be done? So uh, restoration movements uh, never, you know, they can have initial success. But as far as I can see, they, they never they never last entirely. You can't ever go and restore um, what was overturned, you know. And that's the danger for Biden that he is just the restoration candidate, restoration president. Because in 2016, a lot of things weren't working very well, and that's why Trump was elected to some extent. You know, China and China's role in the world economy was an enormous, it is the um, grand strategic question of the 21st century. It is the biggest thing that has happened to the global economy. And it was having an enormous impact on the American economy. And um, there was a resentment about that. And that's not going away. And that was a, um, you know, a bipartisan um, decision to, uh, to, to open, uh, to normalize trade relations with China. Uh, and there is there is a resentment about that that needs to be addressed. So that's uh, you know he can't just go back and assume that things were okay. 
it's the same. Is there a willingness um, for America to defend as many places as it currently defends, you know, alone? Can it continue to spend twice, roughly twice the sort of um, the amount that Europeans spend on defense in defense of Europe? Is that something that can can continue? Does it have pu uh, public support? I don't think it does. And understandably so. So there are there are all of these things. And look at the fo foreign policy in the Middle East. You know, it's very hard to find somebody who can claim that that was a grand success. You know, in 2016, um, America was bogged down in in a lot of places in the Middle East and had been for a long time. You know, it's getting up to 20 years now since the beginning of the Afghan war. And there is no seemingly there is no way out. So the public are demanding change on that front. Uh, Obama signaled and uh, a sort of that he wanted to pivot east and to and he was very skeptical of military intervention in the Middle East and wanted to pull out of Afghanistan but couldn't find a way to do it. These are incredibly difficult questions. So the danger I, I, I agree with Anne is that it, he attempts to be a restoration president. Um, because I don't think there is much support for restoring what was there. So that's he has to figure out what is it um, that Trump has put his finger on and what is the progressive Democrat solution to that. Um, and to uh, and he has to be successful in that. Otherwise, you know, we are going to be back into this cycle, I suspect. So we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, a couple of questions that I really I wanted to hit on. You know, you both talked about this a little bit, uh, but I wanted to go into a little bit deeper. You know, as if if we take as um, the premise that the United States is stepping back, withdrawing its role in the world is changing, what countries do you see as stepping into the void? Whether they're American allies or you know historic allies or historic rivals, uh, is Germany capable, willing to step up into the void? Britain, uh, France, or is is this China's game now? Uh, and do you want to take the take that first? So, I mean, the only possibility that any Western countries have of, as you say, stepping into the void or taking over some of the leadership role that the United States had, for example, in international institutions, the only body that even has that capability is the European Union, because it's the only body that is numerous enough, economically strong enough, and in theory would, 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 be, would have the heft to be able to do that. Of course, it doesn't speak with one voice. It doesn't have a foreign policy right now. It doesn't and have a, its own security policy. And so even saying that, it's, a, it's, it's theoretical. But no, I don't think there are any European countries who could do it on their own, certainly not Britain, um, and, but certainly not France or Germany alone either. I mean, I think, unfortunately, the most likely scenario, um, you know, what really a U.S. withdrawal from uh, means, particularly from international institutions and from many parts of the world, is that China replaces the United States, at least as the hegemon that people love to have. Um, you know, um, so, you know, for example, when the United States announces it has done that it will leave the World Health Organization, that doesn't mean that the World Health Organization will disappear. It just means that China will have a much bigger role in it. Um, and when, as inevitably, we haven't talked about this yet, but in a, you know, in a Trump second term, um, the United States withdraws from the United Nations altogether, that doesn't mean it will vanish. It just means it will be, it will be China's plaything, um, maybe you know, maybe in competition with the EU, but then the EU would have to would have to step up to the plate. Um, and so, you know, there's not a there's not going to be a vacuum um, if the U.S. leaves or abandons or withdraws or or weakens its support or its presence, um, whether it's in Eastern Europe or whether it's in in Asia, um, there will be an immediate response, and others will will fill the role. Um, and un un unfortunately, in most of the world, that will mean either China um, or Iran um, or Russia. Um, or in, or in, in places like Libya, you'll see competition between regional powers over, over who has the most to say, you know, between, between different Arab states and Turkey, for example. Um, and so you may see more civil wars, you may see more conflict, um, and you will certainly see a spread of Chinese-style and Russian-style authoritarianism as countries under the influence of Russia and China adopt their way of doing things and their way of seeing the world. Uh, Tom, do you want to pick up from that? I mean, do you see any appetite in London or Berlin or Brussels for this kind of leadership? Any capability for it? 
you see the appetite in uh, in Berlin and Paris and in Brussels that they they you know they say that they want to uh, you know take on more responsibility, but you don't you see very little action you know on that front. So it's it, I think you have to treat that with you know enormous amounts of skepticism whether there is the political will. Um, for the EU or for Germany, really the, own, the you know the, the dominant player in 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 Europe to to step up. So I think what you're what you're more likely to see if if uh, if America withdraws is great you know essentially great power competition. I'm I'm quite taken by an idea that Kissinger uh, has written about, which is America becomes what Britain was um, in the Victorian era, a kind of offshore island a balancing power it doesn't mean that america has stopped being the most powerful country in the world it will continue to be the most powerful country in the world for a for a long time it still has enormous enormous strengths you know look at its industrial base you know this is something that the european union just doesn't have in fact there are only two places which have a technological you know industrial base uh, one is in california and one is in china the, the the european union just doesn't have that and there are diplomats inside the european union who think hey you know we've got these strengths we've got these ideals but if we don't catch up economically uh, we could be bypassed like china was you know we could go from being a great power to just not having the industrial base to to compete and um, so america con will continue to be extraordinarily powerful the most powerful country but just not supreme and that that is a big that is a big difference and this idea of america as, as an offshore balancing power it means essentially that china is dominant over more of the earth than it is now but america just is, just ensures for its own safety that it is not dominant everywhere that is a completely revolutionized world it's completely different to what we have now which is the united states guaranteeing uh, all of Europe's, um, uh, you know, freedom, as well as much of um, East Asia. So it's a, it's a completely different world we're heading into if that's where we're going. Um, but it, it's it doesn't it, you won't necessarily feel it day to day. I think that's that's another that's another thing to sort of to uh, you know make make that point. You know, it doesn't mean that everyone in America is suddenly going to become impoverished. That's not that's not what we're talking about. But it is a grand change. And, you know, thinking about today's uh, panel, I was uh, reading back through some of uh, the stories that you've both written in the past few months and, and years for The Atlantic. You know, and I'm curious, as we think about this election and the months uh, and years afterwards, what, what do you think the lessons are of, of East Germany in the 30s? Uh, what should we be thinking about as we go forward uh, or, or, or Poland, you know, from your, your time there and, and, and for, from the past 20 years? What, what should we what should we, we be expecting from how America changes? What are the signs we should be looking for? Um, um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure what you mean. There was no East Germany in the 30s. I mean, I assume you mean the 40s. No, sorry. I, I, um, I yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was Might thrown by that for a second. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I do think Americans should um, you know, look, you know, look hard at the history of democracy in their own country and in other places, um, and remember that democracies do decline. Um, and that it has happened before, and that actually our founding fathers knew that. They were reading the history of Greece and Rome while they were designing our constitution, and those are histories of republics that become, um, you know, become dictatorships and, and democracies that become tyrannies. And they were aware of that, and they understood it. And I worry that in our time, both in Europe and, and, and in the United States, we have forgotten that this is a possibility, um, and that you know, without major efforts at reform, without changes to the way this political system works, without um, deeper changes in thinking about the United States and its relationship to the rest of the world, um, the United States is also in danger of experiencing these kinds of declines. Um, um, there's nothing unique or special about America in that sense. Um, you, know, you know, every political system can will eventually fail. Um, and, 
you know, it's my hope that Americans can, in this period of really incredible chaos and um, confusion, it's my hope that Americans will refocus on um, the, you know, the, the ideas and the ideals that, we, that, 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 that were present at our founding and will rethink how do we make our democracy work um, in, you know, in the coming century and how do, we, how do we support other democracies around the world? Because I am convinced that it's only as a community of democracies, as, a, as an international system of linked democracies that, that ours is, is safe as well. Uh, Tom, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, just quickly, you know, you wrote recently about how Churchill in 46 gave this speech in Missouri. You know, the quote that I keep thinking about is, you know, Churchill telling a, an American audience, if you look around you, you must feel not only the sense of duty done, but also you must feel anxiety lest you fall below the level of achievement. You know, really quickly, I know it's hard to summarize, but what do you take away from that in this moment and what risks America has today? Yeah, it's um, – back then, America was um, – was so supreme that this was a warning, right? This was a war. This the idea that Britain uh, told itself back then was, uh, we were Greece to to your Rome. You know, we would teach you how to handle such an enormous responsibility of the empire. You know, and put aside the vanity in that. You know, the, it was an admission that uh, you know, America was dominant everywhere. And and the the truth is that that comes with extraordinary responsibility. Uh, I, you are guarantors of so much that is happening and, um, the, the, you know, of, of European security, East Asian security. Um, but do is there, an, is there an appetite forever to hang on to that responsibility? Sometimes you get uh, sick of responsibility that big and sometimes you haven't got the economic power to sustain it any longer. The world is different from what it was in the uh, in 46 um, you know, we're, we're going to be, can America sustain the empire that it had in 46, uh, in 2046? Um, I don't think so. Well, we're going to leave it there. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to as many audience questions as I would have liked, but uh, Anne and Tom, thank you for this conversation. Thanks to everyone for watching. Uh, we hope you'll join us later tonight for our fourth night at the Atlantic Idea Stage, which begins at 7 p.m. Eastern, and that features interviews with Hillary Clinton, the CEO of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, and many, many more. So see you there. Thank you.